Thanks for clicking on this video. My name is Trey Durden. I'm with the Beltline Church of Christ. If you'd like turning your Bibles over to John chapter 8, and we'll start in verse 31 in just a minute. Really appreciate you being a part of this study, and I encourage you to gather the family together and spend time uh, discussing some of these things, and uh, praising the Lord in song, and enjoying a time of devotion with those who you're with. And then uh, use this hopefully as a catalyst then to minister to others also, to find a way to use technology and other means to reach out to them, uh, even under the, the quarantine that we face at this time. Uh, there's many ways that the church can be effective even now. It's not just preachers who can make videos. Anybody could do it and uh, reach out to neighbors and family members, making sure that needs are met, especially of those who can't do for themselves. Uh, read along with me now in John chapter 8. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Did you hear what he said? If you remain. We're hearing that a lot lately, aren't we? Remain at home. You could infect someone with a virus you don't even know that you might have. And so we do. It's expressing love for our neighbors by quarantining ourselves and staying away for a certain amount of time. And hopefully this thing blows over and, and uh, we'll continue to pray for God to be with those who are infected and those who are struggling uh, with the effects of this virus. And at the same time, uh, keeping our distance so that we don't cause any more problems. So just a few ideas quickly about remaining in his teaching. You know, he tells us that we can be free when we know the truth. So the fact is, if you want to be free, you must remain in his teachings. Remain in his teachings. Uh, you can't distance yourself from the teachings of Christ and somehow say that you are a follower, follower of Christ. No, it, it doesn't work. If you are a follower of Christ, then you remain in his teachings. You follow his teachings. You actually put his teachings into practice in your life. His teachings become your teachings. Over in John 14 and verse 23, Jesus says, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we'll come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. Jesus says, listen, you take my words and you make them your own. You use them in your life. You become more like Christ as you take his word into your heart and live it. As you remain in his teachings, you remain in him and you become more like him and uh, are able then to be light and salt in a world of desperate need. Over in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. Uh, not long ago, Steve Smith, a pulpit minister, said that obedience is God's love language, and there's no doubt. Jesus says it over and over again. The Holy Spirit inspires the writers to say it over and over again to us. Obey. Obey the Lord. Follow his teaching. It truly is a better way to live life when we follow along with Christ rather than somehow going our own direction, which always ends up in misery, sin, and death. You see, Jesus is perfectly clear about his greatest teaching. Someone asked him, what's the greatest command? What's the most important thing, Lord? Mark 12 and verse 30, Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. But then Jesus adds something to that. Those words have been said before. Uh, those words were quoting from the Old Testament, but then Jesus adds to it. Notice what he says. The second is equally important. Now, nobody asks you, hey, what's the second most important command? What, what, what do you really want from us second most? <laughs> Jesus says, listen, this one's equal to the first one. The first one, love God. The second one, he says, then love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. So here we go. Jesus says, love God and love others. This is his teaching, his greatest teaching. This is what he's calling us to as followers of Christ, to love God and to love others. Well, how do I love God? Obviously, he's teaching me to obey, to actually do what he says. And what does he say? Love others. Our love for God is authenticated by our love for one another. When we make sure we reach out in love to minister to one another, to lift one another up. You know, the most loving thing we can do for others is to tell them the truth, to, to reach to them in the truth of God. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 21, it tells us there, Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature, your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Stop 
telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Hear this instruction? He says, I want you to be like Christ. I want you to become more and more like him as each day passes. Stop lying. Stop sinning. Rid your life of sin. Refuse to sin. Become one who, who, who recognizes what sin is and says, you know what? I'm not going to be a part of that because that's what Jesus taught. Jesus taught us to abstain from sin, to recognize it for what it is, and, and to remove it from our lives, always giving ourselves back to him over and over again. Truly, this is the gospel of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he describes it to us. He says the gospel of Christ is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this gospel is really a rhythm of life for us. Not only do we obey the gospel to come into Christ, we continually obey the gospel by living in Christ, dying to ourselves, burying Burying those things that are wrong, those things that hurt us, burying them in Christ and rising up a new person, rising up to do what is right. That's what happens in baptism, isn't it? We repent of our sins, which is like a death, putting it away, getting rid of it, and we're buried in a watery grave and we're risen back up out of that watery grave to walk a new life, a Christian life. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. And so each of us, we live in this rhythm, death, burial, and resurrection, over and over again through our lives as we refuse to sin and as we continue to walk closer with our Savior, Jesus. You know, we have the truth that reveals what we need to do in our lives. When we go to his teachings, it's kind of like going to an x-ray, isn't it? The x-ray reveals the problem. And when we read his word, we recognize that we have a problem. We have sin in our lives. In fact, Isaiah 59 tells us that our sin has separated us from God. And because of this problem, we must be reconnected. We must be brought back. We must be restored to a right relationship with God. And the only way to be restored to that relationship is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus, he gives us that vehicle in the gospel. The way to get back, the way to be restored is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then by obedience to that gospel and then living in the rhythm of that gospel the rest of our lives, we continually reconnect with our Father. Let's remain in the teachings of Christ so that we can continue to enjoy the blessings found only in Jesus. Remember, Jesus told us in John 14 and verse 6 that he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. He says, I am the truth. So let's adhere to the truth and let's be set free by the truth who is Jesus Christ. Uh, secondly, if you want to be free, remain in reality. Remain in reality. Notice there in John chapter 8 and starting in verse 33, uh, the people who Jesus was talking to, they were not living in reality. Listen to their response when he said, the truth will make you free. They said, but we're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. What? What do you mean you will be set free? And then Jesus replies to him in verse 34, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. So Jesus clarifies this by saying, look, sin has made you slaves. The, the, the slavery he's talking about is a spiritual slavery. The, the sin that keeps us from God is enslaving us rather than uh, allowing us to have free access to the blessings that God truly wants to give to every single person. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So we should repent of our sin, come to Christ, and live according to the gospel of Christ. But here we are, separated from him. And the people, in their response to him telling them they can be set free by the truth, say, we've never been enslaved. But wait a second, they're enslaved right now. In this moment, they are subjects of Caesar, uh, the Gentile ruler of Rome, not Judea. These people are actually living under an oppressive regime at this time. Not only that, if they look at their heritage, we know. We know that they were enslaved by the Egyptians. We know that they were enslaved by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. We know the slavery and the history of the uh, uh, Jewish people. And so there's no doubt these people have been slaves. And what they say is a lie. It's not true. They're living uh, according to their wishes rather than in reality. They had deceived themselves. The fact is, sometimes we deceive ourselves also. Uh, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 5, verse 20, Isaiah writes this, What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. <laughs> We truly live in a time where people say that right is wrong and wrong is right. They call evil good and that actually call good evil. 
who don't live in reality. They don't see what's actually happening in the world. And even though they do see it, when they do see it, they don't accept it as fact. They don't recognize it as the truth. Uh, recently, I was reading uh, in, in a book. It's a book by Kelly Monroe Kohlberg, and it's called Finding God at Harvard. She interviews many professors there who do believe in Jesus and talks about how their faith impacts their influence on their students and colleagues. And in the book, though, you can read of a debate with a medical doctor uh, about the place of morality in medical science. To her credit, the atheist doctor flatly states that she does not believe in any absolute standard of right or wrong. She doesn't try to cover up what she really believes. And the fact is, this is a standard in many people's lives today, that there is no truth. The standard that there is no standard, that anyone can do anything that they want, and that there is no judgment. There is no uh, possible way for anyone to say this was right or this was wrong. So Kohlberg, the author, asks this atheist doctor, do you think torturing babies for fun is wrong? The doctor answers, well, I wouldn't want them to do that to my baby. Then the author asks this doctor, you've missed the point of my question. Do you believe there is any circumstance in any culture, in any time in history, in which torturing babies just for pure pleasure would be justified? Is it objectively wrong or is it just an opinion? The atheist doctor said people should be allowed to decide for themselves. Calling evil good and good evil. Saying that there is no standard or deciding that there is no truth living a lie. That's what this doctor has chosen, to live in a lie. You know, I wouldn't want this person on a jury. I wouldn't want this person as a teacher in any school. I wouldn't want this person to be a, a, a law enforcement officer. I wouldn't want them in any position of public trust because this person does not know the difference between right and wrong. And this is the established mindset in academics in the United States today. Just live your truth. Like Jiminy Cricket said, always let your conscience be your guide. The problem is our conscience sometimes steers us incorrectly. It steers us against what is right, and it steers us away from reality. The reality is we're all lost in sin, and we need a Savior. We desperately need a Savior, and that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. Are we deceiving ourselves like those Israelites who are listening to Christ that day, who said we've never been enslaved, when we all know they had been enslaved and even were enslaved at that time? The world we live in today is a broken world, just as the world that they were living in was. A broken world, a world that is engulfed in sin and accepting of those things that are wrong. Over in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, we have a description. The Holy Spirit paints a, a, a very true picture of the world that we live in even today. Starting in verse 18, Romans 1 says, God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. He says, wicked people are suppressing the truth by their wickedness, by their unrighteousness. And so they want to suppress the truth. They don't want to recognize what is real. Rather, they want to live according to a lie. Verse 19, they know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and they've seen the sky. Through everything God has made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, God, uh, yes, they knew God, but they didn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. In verse 25, it says they traded the truth about God for a lie. Have we traded the truth about God for a lie? Is it possible that we've accepted some of the things that society says and, and rather than sticking to the truth that Jesus teaches, we allow it to creep into our lives where we somehow tolerate a false reality, a world that has accepted sin? I want to encourage you, don't give in to the lie. Don't allow the false reality to enter into your mind and your heart, especially not into the minds and hearts of your family or those who you might have influence on. Let's make sure that we speak the truth and that we speak it in love, that we speak it in a way that people can accept it so that they know Jesus Christ, he's the only way out of this world. He's the only way for us to truly live in this world in a manner that would bring glory to our creator, to our God who loves us so very much. Remember, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. 
Let's continue in John chapter 8 now, uh, starting in verse 42. Because if you want to remain free, you must remain in the church. You must remain in the church. John chapter 8, verse 42. Jesus told them, If God were your father, you would love me, because I've come to you from God. I'm not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? Then Jesus answers his own question. He says, it's because you can't even hear me, for you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell you the truth, it's just natural that you don't believe me. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God, but you don't listen because you don't belong to God. Wow, this is one of the harshest teachings that Jesus gives. He says, listen, you don't recognize the truth because you can't, because you've been so deceived by the devil, by Satan, by the evil of this world, that you've accepted that influence rather than living in the influence of God, rather than living according to truth. Remember the greatest commands? The first one is love God with everything in you. The second one is to love your neighbor as yourself, to treat others as you would like to be treated, to, to recognize that our love for God must extend then to other people so that we treat them with respect and kindness and love, and that we would express to them the love that God has expressed to us in Jesus Christ. You see, the church is the family of God. And it's through his family that God wants to make his presence known in this world. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, as Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, I'm writing these things to you now, even though I hope to be with you soon. Now, listen carefully. So that if I'm delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. He says, listen, I, I've given the church to the world in order to change the world, in order to bring the world out of this sin, to stop living a lie, to be able to enjoy the freedom that comes from knowing Christ. And it is the church through which he's going to accomplish this, pur this purpose. You and I have the opportunity, we have the responsibility to express the truth and to express it in love. To, to help others understand the way of the Lord more accurately and then show them what God wants from them. In Ephesians 4 and verse 15, it tells us, We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. If you want to be free, remain in the church. If God is your father, if you're a Christian and you hear the teachings of Christ and gain strength and hope, you grow every day to be more like Jesus through study and prayer and service to others, then you must find a way to continue that rhythm, the rhythm of the gospel, to continue it into the lives of others so that they also might be a part of all that God is doing through his church. In Romans chapter 12, and verse 9, it says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Did you hear that? The instruction is recognize reality and live in it. Recognize what is right and what is wrong and make it known. Don't just know that it's there, but actually live like it's there. Actually make decisions based on the teachings of Christ, which show what is right and what is wrong. And hold tightly to what is good. Verse 10, love each other with genuinely, genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Isn't that the best advice for our situation right now? Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Keep on being enthusiastic about your hope. Make sure that uh, when you send out a text to others, uh, that it's an encouraging text, uh, that you remind them about the hope we have in Jesus, uh, that it is Jesus who is the answer to our problem, which is sin, that it is Jesus who is the cure for the horrible virus that we all suffer from, sin. Sin that trips us up. It keeps us from being who we should be in Christ. Let's do everything we can as we battle uh, the evil influence of Satan, and as we exalt the loving Father to whom we owe everything because of Jesus Christ and because of what he's made accessible to us through Jesus Christ.
I hope that this is encouraging to you. And I want to encourage you now to, to discuss it among yourselves, spend some time in prayer and sing some praises to the Lord. Will you pray with me now? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we could study. We pray that it uh, uplifts each one of us. We pray, Father, that you would help us to stand in reality, to live according to the truth, Father, that we would know the truth and that it truly would make us free as we walk in the rhythm of the gospel, loving each other and especially loving you. Thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.